one of our new initiatives is a sustainability practices survey that the chamber has launched this year. I request Mr. Anirban Ghosh, Chairman Sustainability Committee, Bombay Chamber, and Head Center for Sustainability, Mahindra University, to present the key highlights of the Bombay Chamber Sustainability Practices Survey 2024. Anirban. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's an absolute honor and privilege to be sharing with you the results from the first sustainability practices survey done by the Bombay Chamber. Even as I'm sharing these results with you, India is in the middle of a heat wave where we've got some 40,000 people who've suffered heat strokes, one of them being me over the last weekend. And uh, the occurrence of heat strokes, the occurrence of heat waves increasing is not surprising because in the course of our lifetime, the quantum of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere has increased by 33%. And it is the impact of this increased carbon dioxide and greenhouse, uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. The effects of that is what we are feeling now. The thing is that the rate of increase has not yet slowed down. And we are struggling to reach a situation where we will be able to control the increase of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Chances are that we are unable to control it because while money has started flowing in for climate action, what is happening is much less than what is required. There's been a recent uptick and annually about $1.3 trillion of money is coming into climate action. But what is required on the average is $10 trillion a year. You could look at this as an opportunity for business as we go through uh, the results of this presentation. The story of money in climate action is very similar to the story of sustainability practices in industry. The glass is neither half full nor half empty, but water is pouring into the glass. When we look at the results, you will notice a pattern that intent and desire are very strong. But when the rubber hits the road, there is a fair bit of skepticism, which essentially means that there is a lot of work for us to do to get climate action going and to make climate action impactful. That said, let's look at what uh, members of Bombay Chamber have said in terms of practices of sustainability within their organizations. We look at the core beliefs first. Industries are very convinced about the need to act. But notice that while they're, they're saying that the problem uh, needs to be solved, the risk to business continuity, there's a little bit of skepticism as whether climate change will affect me or not. So clearly, there is greater awareness required in this space. More than awareness, it's, it's about building an understanding of how climate change is posing risks to businesses going forward. And this is where the work done by RBI in the recent past uh, is a step in the right direction, but clearly lots more needs to be done. Industries believe that sustainability is good for business. They are saying, yes, it is meaningful. They are saying, yes, it will improve brand equity. They are saying it will get me competitive advantage. But when it comes to understanding the opportunity that climate change is offering to business, you can see once again that the yellow bit is a little bit higher, showing that, yeah, we believe it is good, but we can't really figure out uh, how good it is and what we need to do. The same pattern continues when we look at this where around two-thirds believe that sustainability actions will help them make money and engage employees. While two-thirds is a very good number, and those of us who have been on the sustainability journey understand that this is indeed very real, you will notice in the results that a very significant portion of our members uh, are saying maybe and are still not very sure about how they will realize the benefits of sustainability action. Most industries want to stay ahead of regulations. 
they want to make the most of the regulations, they want to stay ahead, they don't want to just comply because they're saying that yes, there may be an opportunity in staying ahead of uh, climate change regulations. But they are worried about the cost of doing so and the sources of funding. About half believe that sustainability action requires a lot of cost. The other half don't think so, uh, probably because they realize the returns are very good. Uh, if I may be permitted a slight digression, experiences in the Mahindra group show that investments can, in sustainability action can get you returns in excess of 24% very, very easily, especially when you're getting started. That said, uh, there is a little worry about uh, whether money will be available for taking action in the climate space. Uh, but everyone, most people are sure that they will need to borrow. So here is an opportunity for the financial sector to be able to structure their offerings in a way in which businesses can invest into areas of sustainability where returns are very good. Let's take a look at uh, where current actions are and begin with the fact that more companies are joining the sustainability journey. You will notice that the largest pie is the number of companies who've joined the journey in the last three years time. And this is why I'm saying the glass is filling. It may not be half full or half empty at this point in time. Around half the industries have trained people in place, which also means that the other half don't have trained people in place. And you'll find those, the blue pies where, which indicate that they don't have any dedicated people for sustainability or they have not trained anybody on sustainability. Once again, an area of opportunity for the chamber to work with its members to build awareness and competence in this area. But the fact that half the industries have trained people in place is a big step forward from what we have noticed earlier. Around 60% have started disclosures and reward good performance. This again is, uh, the news is good, but you will also notice that a large proportion of people do not report sustainability action of any kind. So while 60% is a good number of uh, number to have, especially because in the sample size, which is a little bit more than a 110 odd uh, companies, there are many small organizations not covered by the BRSR. So despite that, if we have 60% odd people who are making disclosures of various kinds, it's a good step forward. Now, members are saying that whatever action they do uh, the reviews are done within the organization. A large number are saying that it is uh, the CEO who does the review. Many of them have mentioned that board level reviews have started. But you will also notice that a large number of our members don't have long term goals in the area of sustainability. Now sustainability as you know is a problem that's not going to get solved in a year or two. So while it is important to have annual goals, it is also important to have long-term goals in this area. In future, 70% are aligned to becoming net zero. In fact, for me, the most interesting number is that there are 8% who are saying we are net zero already. I have my fingers crossed that they've got their accounting correct, but for now, I will just be happy that there are 8% people who are saying that they're net zero already. Their alignment with the sustainable development goals is also considerable. And around half plan to take strong environmental action. Environmental action in terms of adopting renewable energy, becoming water positive, becoming zero waste to landfill, and enabling biodiversity rejuvenation. Now these are all good things to do, important things to do, and must be done. But Probably the best news is that two-thirds expect to launch products that will help decarbonize. This is the big opportunity. The trillions of dollars we talked about earlier will be realized only when organizations start relooking at the products and services they offer and have offerings which will help others decarbonize. That's how industry will grow, that's how sustainability action will increase, and that's how sustainability and business, as Ritesh was mentioning earlier in the evening, uh, will go together. 
and not one pulling the other and one being considered as a cost. So one hopes that this number will continue to increase over time and we will find ways of launching products which will themselves have a lower carbon footprint but will help others decarbonize as well. As you saw right through these few charts that I presented to you, that sustainability practices is a story that is gradually gaining momentum. We've got a long way to go, but we've got started. Uh, we did this survey because we thought that it was important to know where our members are to be able to tailor our services for them. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Anirban. Uh, may I request uh, our senior Vice President Designate Rajiv to please come and uh, give a small token of appreciation to Anirban. Anirban is not well, yet he flew down from Bangalore specially for this. And, uh, and this is the first time we've done this survey. We plan to do it on a regular basis. And uh, we had 113 companies participating, of which 60% were large uh, and 40% were MSMEs. So thank you, Anirban. And thank you, Rajiv. So our Honorable Prime Minister, Sri Narendra Modi ji, unveiled Vikshit Bharat at 2047, an ambitious roadmap to propel India towards complete development by the nation's 100th year of independence, that is in 2047. This initiative includes a meticulously crafted blueprint outlining natural vision, aspirations, goals, actionable points. Key objectives include fostering economic growth, advancing sustainability development goals, enhancing ease of living and doing business, bolstering infrastructure, promoting good governance, and strengthening social welfare. Aligned with this vision, the Bombay Chamber of Commerce and Industry will be organizing a series of events, starting with today's panel discussion on Vikshit Bharat 2047, during its 188th annual general meeting, and culminating in the release of a report on Vikshit Bharat in November 2024, when we celebrate our 189th Foundation Day. So for our panel discussion on Vikshit Bharat, I invite our moderator, Dr. Shachinan Shukla, Chairman, EPRD Committee, Bombay Chamber and Chief Economist, Larson and Chubro Limited. Dr. Shukla. And our esteemed panelists, Sri Nilesh Shah, immediate past president, Bombay Chamber, and group president and MD, Kotak Mahindra Asset Management Company. Sri Navaneet Munot, director, Bombay Chamber, and MD and CEO, HDFC Asset Management Company. Mr. Nilkan Mishra, Chief Economist, Axis Bank, and MD and head of global research, Axis Capital and Mr. Shantanu Sen Gupta, Chief India Economist, Goldman Sachs. A round of applause for all of them, please. Over to you, Dr. Good evening, everyone. Um, a very warm welcome to everyone present here, including our panelists. You can see that we've got a stellar panel today, um, and these are all Rohit Sharmas who can hit the ball out of the park. And actually, uh, they don't need any formal introduction. I mean, they're so well known. Um, I have a pleasurable job of asking questions and not answering them. And I also have a slightly unpleasurable uh, task of being the timekeeper. Um, and, and I think one thing that I want to start off with is there is a golden rule of economists, which is for every economist, there is an equal and opposite economist, right? And they're both right or wrong, you can decide. I, I can't say that. And that is why we have got three economists on this panel, right? Um, but we heard the governor, uh, Honorable Governor RBI, uh, talk about growth, which was very, very reassuring. And on a serious note, what a time it is for us to be hosting this panel, right? Uh, the governor also mentioned, and I want to emphasize, that India is at a critical juncture in its economic history, uh, and, and there is a lot to look forward to. Uh, and, and this is also a time where there are multiple global and domestic challenges that India will have to face uh, in, in the coming years and, and decades. And there are multiple global challenges, major themes, uh, decarbonization, deglobalization, and demographic challenges, and last but not the least, technological challenges 
AI and stuff, right? So I, I think this is a very, very critical and delicate moment for India. And looking at the world today, uh, I'm reminded of a quote from George Santanaya, which is, the world is in a perpetual caricature of itself because every moment it presents a contradiction of what it is pretending to be. Why do I say this is if you look at the globe, look at the Western economies, they, they've been preaching something but doing something else. Uh, look at economics, for example. Look at the debt loads that they have. Uh, look at their fiscal uh, positions and the way they are navigating uh, the, the path in terms of fiscal consolidation. They've been preaching something completely different to the other economies, emerging economies, Asian economies. And now when it comes to them, they're, they're doing something exactly opposite. Similarly, uh, in terms of decarbonization, when it comes to their own economies, they talk something and then go back to fossil fuels the moment there is slightest of troubles, right? So this is the kind of backdrop we have for the global economy. And if I look at uh, the Indian economy right now, it is a complete contrast. So this is an economy where the narrative is, as we speak, uh, that our first trillion took about 58 years, right? The next one took about 12 years, and the third took about five. And extrapolating similar sort of trajectory, people believe that the next decade or so will be adding a trillion dollars to the economy every 18 months, right? And that is stupendous. If you look at infrastructure, for example, uh, this is a crystal number that I'm citing now, 143 lakh crore investments in the next seven years. And this is going to be double of what we did in the last seven years. Similarly, on the saving side, numbers, I mean, last 25 years, 10 to 12 trillion, and people extrapolate that it will become 100 trillion plus in, in the, in the uh, same period uh, going forward. But this uh, brings me to a very interesting story from uh, Bertrand Russell, uh, which is the story of chicken. I, I hope you've heard of it, but let me remind you. So there is this chicken, uh, which is sort of doing an economist's job, trying to extrapolate current trends into the future. So it sees that every day the farmer brings food at given time, I mean thrice a day or four times a day, and then it forms a hypothesis that the farmer really loves me and I'm going to get at least three meals a day. And then the hypothesis becomes much more strengthened because every single feeding session, his hypothesis becomes stronger and stronger. And then one fine day, the farmer comes and wrings the neck breaks the neck of the chicken. And this is the dilemma, this is the juncture. In our economic history, we've seen such rosy forecasts. Uh, we, and I'm, I plead guilty to being one of the practitioners in, uh, for some of our road shows. I've used 2004-2008 uh, uh, rosy forecasts like this. And we know what happened, we, we got a lost decade. So I'm, I'm not saying that things are going to be as bad, but this is something that I would want our panelists to address. And one more thing before we begin the question, uh, question uh, session with the, with the panelists, is any number, any statistic that you look at for India, please be aware of the sheer numbers, the absolute size. So if you talk about the median income, Below that, the 50% is 70 crore people, live human beings, right? Uh, the working force or, or the labor force that we talk about, uh, of the 92 crore people, only about 60 crore are employed. And to give you a perspective of, of that number, America's population is 33 crores, right? So I, I think this is something that we need to, to keep in mind. Um, and let me now uh, go to our panelists and then start the uh, uh, session. We'll be doing two rounds, one for the longer term, and the second one is uh, the shorter term horizon. So Nilesh Bhai, I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, could you please help us define what is this Viksit Bharat? How should we imagine India of the 2047? Good evening. 
there are three subsets in India today. One which is rich and 1% of Indian population today enjoys lifestyle of French citizen. About 27% is middle income. They enjoy lifestyle of a middle income country like Indonesia. And rest 72% is living in sub-Saharan Africa. So if I have to define Viksit Bharat, a Bharat where no one is in sub-Saharan Africa, everyone is either in a middle income country or a rich country. That should be our one unified objective. Second, to achieve that objective, we can't follow the current model of development. India is the lowest per capita carbon emitter in the world and we need to remain there, otherwise the world will blow out. So we have to create growth to shift people from poverty to middle income, but in a climate friendly manner. If we can create an inclusive and a climate friendly growth, India will become Viksit Bharat. Thank you, Nilesh Bhai. Um, I, I think with that sort of framing of what is really Viksit Bharat or, or developed uh, India, uh, let me move to uh, Navneet. Could you just highlight some of the key imperatives of the long term India story and also some of the risks that we should be aware of when we try and extrapolate the India story or, or the Burton Russell chicken story? So as Nilesh Pai said that about that 72% will be a developed country where we won't take pride that every poor now has got a car, but we'll take pride that now rich people are taking public transport. That day we should think, yeah, we become a developed country. Uh, I, think, I think whichever way, if you look at vivid pictures in terms of digital infrastructure, we are almost a developed country. I think we can proudly claim the stuff that we are doing and what we are going to do over the next several years. We are one of the most advanced countries. On physical infrastructure, we are moving very fast. I've mentioned several times that one Oscar went to RRR, then others should go to roads, railways, renewables. There is no country on planet Earth which is building these things at the pace at which we are building. You can add broadband, you can add even the ports, airports and other stuff. Uh, I think the next couple of years, leveraging on the power of digital technology, I think we can leapfrog on social infrastructure also, which has been the weakness over the last seven or eight decades. We have a long way to go. But we have seen in financial inclusion that how from very small part of the population which had a bank account and now everybody has got a bank in pocket, we just leapfrog from no telephone to a state mobile phone. We didn't have any computer. Now everybody's got a smartphone. Something similar, I think, is likely to happen in areas, or we have a potential to do that in education, in healthcare, in skill development, where what would have taken decades, I think we can do in, in years. So that's my kind of like the developed country, the way it should uh, look like. <coughs> One of the biggest reform that India has undertaken in the last couple of years, the governor you know, talked about IBC, he talked about uh, uh, GST, he talked about monetary policy committee framework, we can add RERA, a few others. To me, I think one of the biggest reform in India is a very high quality social security net in the last 10 years. And that's, I call India's UBI. It is not the universal basic income as everybody knows, but this is a little different. This is a free toilet, a basic, I mean a cooking gas, tap water, Ayushman Bharat, 800 million people, rice and wheat, Sukanya Samriddhi, PM Kisan, I mean some of those kind of things. This is exceptional at $2,000 per capita, two and a half thousand dollars per capita, the way we have delivered to the country of our size is, is absolutely exceptional. I think we leverage the power of Aadhaar, mobile phone and the bank account of, of everyone and the way we have delivered is exceptional what we can do. If you ask me about the risk for the next 25 years, I will highlight three. The number one is the climate change. Uh, Nilesh Bhai talked about it and everyone made a beautiful presentation. I think we are one of the most vulnerable countries where you, if you have like 72% people at subsistence level and a large part of the population dependent on agriculture and the rural economy, the number of heat wave days, I mean, whichever way you look at it, I think climate change is for real, we need to accept it. Uh, this could be like a real risk for, 
for like everybody, all the human beings, but particularly because we are just starting our, our growth journey, it, it can be a challenge. The good part is that government is very well aware of it and Prime Minister's Panchamarath is, is so inspiring. The second risk, I would say the AI and ML, which again is a very big opportunity. I just mentioned that we can leapfrog on many areas where which would have taken decades, but on the other side of it, I think this is the fourth biggest revolution in human history. The first was agriculture, the second was manufacturing revolution, then it was information, and what we are seeing is the intelligence revolution. Any job which is like repetitive in nature, I mean in crude terms it is said that anything which is dull, dumb and dangerous won't be done by human beings. Good, I mean human beings shouldn't be doing that. But the fact is over the next several years when we have to create millions of jobs, how AI can kind of like uh, play a role. We need to be mindful of that. We can actually utilize it and, and we can leverage on, on it and can do many things which otherwise wouldn't have been possible, but we should be very mindful of, of what it can do in terms of uh, jobs and how do we need to reskill because the time is very short. We don't have decades to really uh, to kind of like uh, get ourselves adjusted to it. And the third is the geopolitics. I think our generation was very lucky. We lived in the most peaceful era in human history, one of the most peaceful era in human history, but that period was probably two or three years back. There are hot wars going on and there's one of the biggest cold war China and, and the West or China and US. Uh, I think it can have many, many implications. Of course, we haven't seen that on, on the economies or we haven't really seen that on markets so far, but we need to be very mindful. Of course, there is a big opportunity for India because we are an oasis of hope and, and given the largest democracy in the way we, have, we are playing our game, it's an opportunity, but at the same time, we need to be very mindful of the risk that it can bring. So, Neil Kant, coming to you, uh, Navneet highlighted some of the key risks from a long-term perspective, which includes uh, the, the environmental perspective. If you were to think of 2047 from here till 2047 and beyond, what are some of the key macro uh, structural themes or, or reforms that the government should stay put on? And also incrementally, would you want to add some suggestions on, on that count from a long-term perspective? Yeah, no, uh, good evening everyone. The, the first thing I would like to highlight is that this chat of Vixit Bharat, it almost makes it seem inevitable that we are going to become a developed country by 2047. Uh, the way I see it and the way I look at what China has done, uh, there were gut-wrenching reforms happening every five years. Uh, if they had gone wrong, the regime would have been destabilized. And if we need to compress what the developed countries did in 200 years into 50 years, we have to, at every moment of time, continue to challenge how we can do things better. And therefore, the moment we start assuming, like we did between 2010 and 2012-13, that, uh, oh, 8 percent growth is a given, is when we start to slip. Uh, so we need to be very cautious about, so when we aspire to Vixit Bharat, I think it's extremely important to have a strong vision, but underneath that there needs to be a desire to, to withstand a lot of stress and a lot of uh, uh, reform. The most important, I think, is going to be on the fiscal side. Remember that what India is trying to do has never been done in history. Uh, we are trying to compress 200 years of growth into 50 years. We are doing it at a time when demographic pressures are accelerating. So the demographic transition in every country is faster than the economic transition. So our total fertility rate, if some, you had asked someone in 2016-17, when would it fall below sustenance? They would have said 25, 26, maybe 2030. 2020 is when already we are below sustenance. Uh, so we have a 30-year window to grow and we have to make the most of it. The second big problem is that when you develop, inequality is inevitable. In the first stage, you know, you look at the Arthur Lewis growth model, the Simon Kuznets growth, growth curve, inequality is inevitable. Every country which has gone through this stage was not a democracy. China is still not a democracy. We have to handle significant income and wealth inequality without losing track of the medium term path. 
and for that you need significant uh, fiscal rectitude as well as a strong drive to improve tax to GDP so that there are resources available for the governments so that they can manage the democratic side of it. So that I would think is the most important part. So GST, rationalization, I don't know how feasible it is, but if I was prescribing and I have the privilege, as you said, of prescribing, I think we have to uh, streamline GST significantly. We have to significantly ex uh, uh, expand the tax base, uh, direct tax reform, especially for the non-salaried people, I think is extremely important. The second big area of reform has to be, so like, like Navneet mentioned, you know, we managed to connect urban centers very well, roads, railways, ports and all that. We are terrible, terrible at within city infrastructure. And if you can't do that, you cannot grow. Currently, the fiscal structure is such that the cities don't get enough money. Now, I know, if you give them money, there will be corruption. I mean, you have to look the other way, just like what the Chinese went through, 15 years of rampant corruption, but things got built. When you compare a developed economy to where we are, the biggest problem is capital stock. Why is it that people in Japan or Spain have so much leisure time than us? Because they have capital stock. They have efficient houses, efficient trains, efficient urban infrastructure. They spend less time doing the basic things. We do not know how to build urban infrastructure at scale. We need to do what we have done in Mumbai over the last five, six years into 1,000 cities. We don't know how to do it. And I think that has to be an extremely high priority for all state and central governments. The third thing that we need to start thinking about is how to break through the middle income trap. Uh, remember that uh, the path that you take from lower, in middle, lower income to middle income is not the path that you take from middle income to higher income. Because in lower to mid, you are copying everyone's technology. You take 4G seven, eight years after everyone has used it and you get the cheapest data in the world. Phenomenal. I think it took a lot of doing, take us to a, a very, very high level. But in 6G, we need to be ahead. We need to be at the forefront when competing with the best people. And for that, you need risk capital, you need entrepreneurs who can fail. So India has to start controlling technology, developing technology, more R&D, more branding. If we can't do that, we will fall the way the Latin American countries have done, where we are unable to break through the middle income trap. So there are many things to do, but I think these three, in my mind, are the most important. Solve urban infrastructure, otherwise the real estate cycle ends in the next three years. The reason we are growing so fast is because the real estate cycle has turned. If we can't build infrastructure, the real estate cycle ends in five years. Uh, if we have to sustain it, we need to build infrastructure. So fiscal reform, urban infra, and make India a product nation. So what Neil Kant is saying essentially is there is no divine right that India has in terms of growth and that 8% extrapolation or, or the hypothesis that a lot of people have uh, for future decades is, is not really going to come by without reforms. Reforms is a, is a story that has to continue uh, and, and he gave the example of China. Um, Shantanu, coming to you now, we're talking long term here and since you represent uh, uh, MNC or F FII uh, how, and, and you put on that hat and maybe walk us through what are the global uh, imperatives and, and the way the globe is going to evolve and within which, I mean, what kind of backdrop, global backdrop will the Indian economy have to navigate uh, going forward? Yeah. Uh, thanks and uh, welcome everyone. Um, I, think, I think there are basically three broad drivers globally uh, that are going on, some of which Neelkant already alluded to, but I'll just expand on them a little bit more. One is that while we are talking about 7 and 8% growth for India, remember the backdrop is that global growth will be slowing down, mainly driven by population growth. Uh, that Neil talked talk, talk, talked about, but along with that, probably, and this is slightly more contentious, productivity growth globally also will possibly slow down a little, because you know the the benefits that you had for of of globalization, uh, you are probably going to give up over the next 30 years, and you know countering that on the other side will be technological progress, AI, and so on. So I'm I'm not really sure where you land up on productivity, but it's likely that a little bit of slowdown will happen there. 
The second is that the period of US exceptionalism in terms of growth is going to be behind us. Uh, you know, last decade, uh, US really outperformed in terms of growth. And if you think about the next 10 or 20 years, potential growth of US is going to be lower than emerging markets overall, but significantly lower than India. So then you're, you're getting into a stage where the largest economy in the world is slowing down in terms of potential growth, and India's potential growth is, uh, is, is rising. Whether it goes, goes to 8% or not, we'll see. And you know, with that, the, the, the reforms that Nilkan talks about are, are super important. Along with that, you're going to have the, the dollar cycle that you have also possibly turn. Because you know, if you look at you know, trade-weighted dollar over the last 50 years, you've had these you know, long cycles up, down. You're right now probably at a peak. And every time you've had a turn in the dollar cycle, emerging markets obviously has outperformed. LATAM, SIMIA slightly more because of the currency effects. But Asia also outperforms. And you're probably going to face that, get that tailwind as well. And the final point I would make uh, is, is Neilkan talked about inequality, but he talked about local inequality. Global inequality has actually benefited with globalization over the last 20 or 30 years. And you're getting into a stage now where that probably will you know, likely continue. So you know, poorer countries will get richer. And you're going to have a local inequality increase as as Neilton talks about, and that will be difficult to manage politically for all emerging markets, not just India. That will be difficult to manage politically, especially when you're also going up on the global stage. So if you now put one and three together, you know, you are having demands of, you know, having a seat on the, on the, on the global stage, both in terms of economics, in terms of security and, and so forth, and you're battling local inequality at the same time when you're at that seat, right? So that, that's, that's a very, uh, very delicate political and international politics navigation uh, in, in our view. Um, in terms of risks, again, you know, completely agree with you. Know, I, I think all panelists brought it out, you know, uh, climate change and technology is going to be there. I think the third point I'll, I'll just point out because, you know, we are talking long term again on, on, in this round is that you're not going to have the benefits of globalization that, that China had. When China was growing, China you know, did not have a China to compete with, one. Two, it benefited you know, just in time for that globalization drive. You're going to have more industrial policies pan out across economies, whether it is developed or, or emerging. Uh, and and you know, given limited fiscal resources that, that Neil Gunn talks about, you know, what kind of fiscal resources you're throwing at which sector needs to be very well thought out. Because, you know, you, you, don't, you don't have the space to spray all around and just hope that, you know, some bullets stick. Uh, and, and therefore, in this world, you just need to be extremely thoughtful, maybe a little bit more time to just think this through before you're throwing those uh, fiscal levers or bullets to, to uh, grow those sectors. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Shantanu. I, I think uh, we now have a fair bit of understanding in terms of how to think about India in 2047 and, and beyond, right? Um, we can reimagine a country with fairly significant potential uh, when it comes to the outlook and also significant challenges going forward. It's not going to be easy navigating these global mega trends uh, and there is a fair bit of uh, ask from the government and the governments to come to be able to achieve some of these landmarks or, or the, the potential, realize the real potential of, of the economy. I'll now divert attention to slightly near term because uh, again, like I mentioned, uh, the, the chicken's hypothesis, we don't want to really extrapolate too far into the future and maybe uh, refocus on slightly nearer term. When I say nearer term, I don't mean tomorrow, but I mean, you can use your lens of, of the near term. Uh, Nilesh Bhai, coming back to you, um, there has been a change in the, slight change in the political mandate. And a lot of people um, who are extrapolating continuity of, of the same things, macro stability and all of that, are now beginning to 
pose questions or at least have questions in their minds whether the same is going to continue uh, and probably the budget is going to be the litmus test. A lot of people will base or, or rephrase their hypothesis in terms of growth uh, basis what is done in, in the budget. Uh, could you just walk us through uh, in, in terms of what do you think will be the imperatives from the budget and, and will there be a change essentially in terms of signaling on macro stability and stability, uh, policy continuity? So, Sachin Nandan, this is my guess and it could be as good as anyone's guess. There are few things which will be buried deep under the ground. For example, uniform civil code, population control bill. Those are the contentious issues that will get buried, but they are not going to impact our growth. There are few things which will continue as before, like infrastructure push, digital India, uh, r and in defense, make in India. Uh, these are the things which will carry forward the momentum which Governor RBI talked about. Our economy is in momentum. There are few things which will continue like asset monetization, free trade agreements, but they are not going to materially add to our growth. They are good thing to happen. But there is also possibility that few things will get delayed. Consensus will have to be built on it. Land reforms, labor reforms, farm reforms. These are the things which can impact our long-term growth trajectory. In the near term, momentum may carry us forward. But unless until we do those tough decisions as Nilkant was mentioning, it's unlikely that we'll be able to sustain it for long. So my recommendation or prayer will be let the budget be vote on account plus something. And that something has been delivered by RBI by way of 1,23,000 crore additional dividend. The vote on account delivered on fiscal prudence at 5.1% fiscal deficit to GDP. And it also delivered infrastructure push without going populist way ahead of election. This 1,23,000 crore, please use it for infrastructure investment. Please use it for some consumption boost at the bottom end of the pyramid. And without letting go fiscal prudence, you can still create a balance. The momentum along with this kind of budget will carry forward the economy. Hopefully, monsoon god will be fine. And in that period, try to create consensus for tough decisions like land reforms, labor reforms, farm reforms. Can that happen? Of course, it's going to be difficult, but we have no option but to achieve it if we want to ensure that our growth is more sustainable. So, Neelkant, coming to you, um, I think what are the hallmarks of, of the government has been so far, last 10 years, is the emphasis on infrastructure-led growth strategy. Uh, there have been a lot of detractors, there, there are a lot of noises, voices on uh, supporting consumption and, and things like that. Um, do you think this, there is going to be any change or possibility? So you did speak about the long term and urban urbanization and urban infra. Do you think in the near term, uh, the government is probably going to change its emphasis uh, or, or the strategy of uh, infrastructure led growth? And also uh, a lot of, uh, I think, questions in, in the minds of people whether it's going to be steroids versus, uh, using uh, Navneet's phrase, multivitamins, which way will, will the government go, in your opinion? Uh, again, as Nilesh Bhai said, uh, we are only guessing. I mean, there is very little insight on what the government is likely to do. Uh, this question of whether the government will change its fiscal stance, uh, either in the sense that their fiscal consolidation path or the nature of fiscal spending is, is almost a default question in any meeting I have these days. Right? So I'm very well rehearsed. So I, I will give you a three-layered argument. Uh, so there are three levels at which you have to think. 
and uh, let me run you through that. So the first one is is almost an incredulous comment. Oh, they, they lost 60 seats or 63 seats. Why won't their policies change? So when we make a comment like that, uh, we are acting like a guy with a hammer to whom everything looks like a nail. When, when you, if you remember the Pakistan match, uh, India-Pakistan match, and it felt like Kohli scooped the ball, then Suri Kumar Yadav scooped the ball, then Shubham Deve uh, shook the ball. And you would say, kya kar rahe? Matlab, you know, can't they play? And the next day you see Henrik Klaasen scoring 46 and 44 balls, and you say, oh, maybe the pitch is slow. The ball wasn't coming onto the bat. So when you're on the ground, you see the ball, the game very, very differently. So when politicians interpret the verdict, they are thinking very differently. When you see the council of ministers and the way the BJP is now signaling to the Dalits, you know how they are interpreting it. You don't have to go down the path that, you know, if it was just interpreted as the poor voting against the BJP, then why is it that they did not lose that many seats in Bihar? Why is it that they win Odisha? That why is it that they won Madhya Pradesh, swept again, didn't even lose any vote share? So, so that's step one. But you say, okay, fine, no, you don't get it. We understand it is the poor who voted against and the BJP has to act against that. Okay, what are you going to do about it? What actions will you take? Will you, as, as Navneet mentioned, uh, teach them how to fish, give them the tools how to fish, so give them electricity, give them toilets, give them houses, asset building, or are you going to throw money at it? Uh, if you again see the actions, one of the first schemes that seems to have come out of the blocks is the Pradhan Mantri Avas Yojana Grameen, where they're talking about four crore houses and a spend of four lakh crores over five years. So when they go to the elections in 2029, out of the 18, 20 crore rural houses, four crore houses will have some reason to select or stamp on Kamal Chap. Now, those are the kind of schemes that the government prioritized in the 14 to 19 period. They could not do it between 19 and 24 because of COVID, because of other distractions. The state governments were not fully functional. Those are the kind of policies I think the government is going to, again, act on. And those seem to be the priority because the problem with, with spending or just throwing money at people is that it doesn't stick. And that brings me to the third level. So if you say that, no, you're wrong on the first one, you're also wrong on the second one, no, no, they're going to give a consumption stimulus. The third is, when do you do it? If you're doing it for political gains, which is what everyone seems to be assuming, why would you do it now? You would do it in 27, or you would do it in late 28, early 29. So I don't think there is going to be a massive change in the fiscal stance. In fact, there is a stronger likelihood that schemes like that rooftop solar scheme where you know, you're giving uh, you're trying to give free energy to one crore households, maybe then expand it to 10 crore households. Uh, uh, schemes like, uh, you know, where you allow some credits for skilling and all of that. So those are the type of schemes which I think the government is going to prioritize. Uh, that is my expectation. I have no knowledge as to what's going to happen. So that is uh, reassuring in, in terms of uh, while it is your expectation, I, I think this will be uh, quite reassuring coming after what the governor said in terms of the growth outlook, etc. Uh, and macro stability and policy continuity has actually led India's outperformance and, and the kind of interest uh, that India has uh, garnered over, over the last few years. Um, Shantanu, uh, if, if you can probably, I'll, I'll come with a slightly uh, difficult Question, in the sense, this has been the holy grail since 2008, uh, GFC crisis. Uh, generation of jobs, right? I mean, it, it's caused multiple issues in the West. Western economies are going through a lot of political, social, and economic upheaval. Uh, looking at our numbers, I mean, the demography and the demographic dividend, etc. How do you see the job story really evolving? And this also connects to the political mandate. Some people are saying that uh, not enough jobs were created and consumption suffered and in pockets, and that is led to which, which Neil Kant, uh, I mean, sort of refuted. But do you, how do you see this job challenge really evolving? Uh, especially in the context of technological changes, AI and, and stuff like that are, are software jobs, right? Um, how, how do you see this story panning out uh, in, in the near term and if you want, maybe the longer term as well? 
Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll get to that. I just can't resist a bite at the fiscal. Nilkan got both. So I'll, I'll just add that, agree with all of what Nilkan said, and the starting point of public debt to GDP is 80% plus. Right? It's, it's the worst in the EM complex when you put LATAM and CMEA also together. So you've got to be super careful with what you do with your fiscal resources. Okay, coming to the question. Uh, I don't think there is, I mean, we, we are in the, not in the camp of, you know, an option between manufacturing versus services. Uh, we think that, you know, you, you just have to do both given, given the jobs imperative. Now, within that, I think the services part, I'll just call out because of two reasons. One, because of both uh, Nilesh Bhai and Navneet brought up that, you know, technology being one of the big drivers in terms of, you know, global growth also and, you know, the most contentious geopolitical uh, topic pro probably over the next 20, 20 years. India has a, a, a starting point advantage there, right? You know, you, you're very strong in your, your, in your services. You've built a strong base in IT services. You have now graduated up. So this GCC story is told multiple times. You know, it's worth 45, 50 billion dollars. But the the micro detail is that within that, if you see engineering, research, and development, India has actually scaled up. So you know, while you consider going into more labor-intensive manufacturing, which is at the lower end of the manufacturing pyramid, in services you're already scaling up in terms of the value add. Some of the some of the jobs which can be very quickly replaced by technology, you've already started passing on to the rest of the world, namely ASEAN. And therefore, you should double down on that advantage. Uh, you have very sharp math stat computing talent in the country, and you should just double down on, a, on that advantage and, and try to envision for the future what kind of challenges can come up. And you know, I, I can think of two. One is that, you know, you understand protectionism right now in terms of manufacturing, tariff, non-tariff barriers. It's a matter of time before this comes up in a big way in services also. And we should, we should not wait for that to come up before reacting. We should, we should sort of think this out beforehand to, to seal that advantage. The second is what, is, and you know, it's partly what Nilton talked about earlier with regards to cities and, you know, completely and wholeheartedly agree. Look at what's happening with Bangalore, and you know, 35% of your GCC jobs are right now there, and then you have a distribution across Pune, Bombay, and, and, and Delhi, I mean NCR, and that's about 80 or 90% of your GCC jobs. But you're saying that you have great broadband connectivity, and you know, your 4G nation, and, and, and so forth, and your digital connectivity is great. Why can't you not decentralize it? Why does Bangalore need to therefore go through that water pressure, the traffic pressure, and, and so on, right? That is something that, you know, is, is, is locally manageable and should be thought about. But the first one is, is more global. It, these challenges will come up, uh, you know, and, and, you know, we should, we should possibly think about it. So jobs, you know, just to come back, I would think of it as like a barbell approach. One, go for the high-end tech services, and two, try to do as much of low-end manufacturing as possible to employ the masses, eventually agree with Navneet, some form of UBI and, you know, saving that fiscal space to, uh, to, to cater to that will be important. So Navneet, uh, coming back to you, uh, when you look at the near term and in the context of the changes that we've seen uh, lately, what are the signals you, you pick up being, being a market person uh, in, in terms of flows and in, we know that India is going to get included in, in some of the bond indices and the flows have already begun to come in anticipation as well. Uh, how do you see investors, especially the global ones uh, and, and, and the domestic included, uh, looking at the India story in, in, the, in the near term and also the flows and sentiments and anything else that you would want to add? So, what the <coughs> Over the last couple of years, market has been more driven by the domestic flows than the foreign flows. As we know that the foreigner's ownership of Indian equities has come down from 25% to now 17% or so, while the domestic ownership has gone up, which is good because historically we were extremely vulnerable to 
to global flows. Our markets were extremely vulnerable to global flows. I think this power of domestic savings flowing into the Indian equities or, or risk assets in general is a very positive trend and I think it's, it's very, at a very, very early stage of, of, of uh, that trend which will keep us in good stead where we can channelize savings into productive assets over a period of time and can, can aid to the capital formation. Uh, from the foreigners' perspective, over the last uh, couple of quarters or so, the foreign flows have uh, not been as you hear about the growth narrative of India or the long-term potential of India or the whole Vixit Bharat story. Many reasons. One is that emerging market as an asset class has not been doing well and our weight which used to be 7-8% has become now almost 16-17%. So they used to be substantially overweight. That too in a in, in couple of sectors which for a variety of reasons haven't done as well. Now that weight is like 17-18%. <coughs> Structurally, if you ask me over the next uh, five, ten years, whether we'll get more, um, of course, as a percentage that will keep coming down because the domestic flows uh, will be larger and larger. Structurally, uh, if you ask me whether foreigners will uh, invest more money into India, my answer would be yes. Historically, over the last 24 out of 31 years or so, foreign investors have been a not net buyer of Indian equities for mainly two reasons. And despite different economic cycles, political cycles, business cycles, profit cycles, uh, global as well as domestic, the reason why foreigners have been net buyer of Indian equities in last 24 of, out of 31, if I remember the number correctly, for two reasons. Number one is a top-down India, long-term India story. There are not many places on planet Earth where you've got for 30 years a nominal GDP growth of 10, 11 percent. Uh, I mean, a corporate profit growth of almost 12, 13 percent. Low penetration across many categories. Uh, policy certainty, so on and so forth. So top-down story has been just phenomenal of the structural growth. The second reason is a bottom-up stock picking opportunity. Regardless of the cycles, you always get good set of companies to invest in relative to any other emerging market. I mean, this is like a stock picker's paradise across many sectors in consumption, in, in investments, in financials, in, in, in many sectors, the kind of companies uh, continuous growth, good return ratios, high quality management, very high quality governance and disclosures relative to any other market and the depth that we have in capital market. I think the third dimension that's getting added now, which should lead to India getting more flows over a period of time, is the domestic money. Because what domestic money is doing, continuous flow of domestic money is doing is reducing the volatility of the market on a structural basis. So the way you put India on, on, on a risk return spectrum, the attractiveness of Indian market goes up even more and then the depth and the breadth of the market increases even more because if this kind of flows continue 30, 35 billion dollars now which will become 50, 60 billion dollars in a few years time the number of new businesses that will get listed so the attractiveness of Indian markets only go up so I feel more positive I'll just take maybe 30 seconds on the FDI side because this year uh, I think on a trailing 12 month basis our FDI flows would be lowest in last 10, 12 years uh, of course even on the gross number they are down and, and even the net number is down. One of the reasons is that a lot of private equity and venture capital firms have been able to exit the businesses and are repatriating money. If you again ask me from a longer, though we feel uh, you know, uh, uh, looking at, the, the, I mean, it, it doesn't look like a good picture, but if you think from a longer term perspective, if they are able to, if they are seeing an exit window where several other parts of the world are seeing a, a dark winter uh, in, in, in the private equity and the venture capital market, I think that should increase attractiveness of India on a structural basis even for those uh, people who are looking to invest in private markets. So this is now, uh, we are probably at the fag end of, of this conversation. Uh, if you could just leave behind a snapshot or a pictorial postcard for us for India in 2047 or a long-term India story, what would that picture be? And also any ask, specific ask. These are short answers. I mean, anything that you expect from the government, one ask from the government. So these two things, one picture of the long-term India story and one ask from the budget or, or the, the government. Each one of you, uh, very quickly. And then we'll open for Q&A. So in the budget, please don't change anything on long-term capital gains tax. <laughs> Let capital be created. 2047 India 
as I mentioned, India where there is no Africa. Wow, oh, okay. I, I think when we will be the most reliable and trustworthy factory of the world, farm of the world and front office of the world, I think we should aspire for that and I think we'll get there. The one ask would be while we take a lot of pride in India's demographics that we are like our median age is 28 or 29, but as you mentioned about the demographic challenge also over the next 10, 20 years as the TFR falls below 2%, but even otherwise, we'll have the largest number of old people also and starting at 81% public debt to GDP, we won't have the luxury of providing retirement money to the people. We can give toilet, we can give basic electricity, one LED bulb, maybe tomorrow have one mobile phone or whatever, but we won't be able to manage retirement of people. That's why one of the main things that the government has to do is put retirement security as one of the top of the agenda. How are we going to ensure that we have a widespread participation in risk assets from almost all or large part, large number of households in India. If we don't think of that and take a myopic view on how we can collect, as Nilesh Bhai rightly mentioned, it may look like because we are from capital market, we are asking for it, but there is a larger agenda. If we don't do that and think in a very myopic manner of like how much tax revenues we can collect from one asset class or another, I think we won't be achieved the retirement security for a large number of India. We'll be the richest country in the world from an size of the GDP, but we'll have large number of people who won't be able to make both ends meet and we cannot afford that as a democratic country. So Neil, can quickly one picture, long term picture and one ask? Yeah, I mean, uh, so it's many perspectives have been given. I would say that we will have a very large number of Indian multinationals uh, which will be dominating product and service categories globally. Uh, in terms of the budget, I think, see budgets, we tend to overhype. These are, these are not supposed to be media events. This is a message uh, which is only on the fiscal side and I think, I hope that the government continues down the fiscal consolidation. Yeah, I mean, you know, look, budget, fiscal consolidation, don't try anything, anything different, it's just going right. Um, I think in terms of 2047, you have the opportunity of becoming both the green energy leader and the high-tech leader of the world. Uh, and green energy leadership is the only way you're going to be able to increase uh, per capita energy consumption, which needs to increase without blowing up the, the region, at least, of the planet. And on a lighter note, uh, I was talking to one uh, high-frequency trader. Uh, he said that, look, with some changes, uh, Indian high-frequency traders should be making a killing, just like Jane Street made a billion dollars out of us, that there is enough talent here that we should be, in five years' time, making a killing in the U.S. markets. So on that note, uh, given the time constraint, now putting my timekeeper hat, uh, I'm sure that you, you enjoyed this interaction as much I did hosting it and I'm sure you have multiple questions and you can catch hold of these people uh, after we finish. So thank you so much panelists. A round of applause please and thank you so much for listening to us. Full discussion. May now call Ritesh and Pinky to give a small token of appreciation to our speakers and moderator.
Hesitate. Thank you, Pinky, Dr. Shukla, Nilesh Bhai, Namneet, Nilkant, and Shantanu. Thanks a lot. As we reach the end of the session, I invite Mr. Rajiv Anand, Senior Vice President Designate Bombay Chamber and Deputy Managing Director Axis Bank to deliver the vote of thanks. Rajiv. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, it is my honor to deliver the vote of thanks uh, at the 188th uh, AGM uh, of the Bombay Chamber. On behalf of, the, behalf of the Chamber, I extend my sincere thanks to this August gathering. My deep gratitude to the Chief Guest, uh, the Governor Reserve Bank. Uh, it is deeply heartening to hear uh, Sri Das speak about how India is at the threshold of a major structural shift in its growth trajectory moving towards 8% GDP growth. And I think as all of us run businesses, I think that is something that is really heartening to hear. He also spoke about how the Indian economy in the last financial year contributed 18.5% to global growth. Uh, and that is definitely a no mean achievement. Um, Ritesh, thank you so much. Uh, Ritesh, President, uh, Bombay Chamber, and CFO Hindustan Lever, uh, for your evocative presidential address and for guiding the chamber over the last one year. Uh, Pinky, um, thank you for delivering the mission statement, and I look forward to working closely with you uh, in, in the coming year. The chamber has launched the sustainability practice survey. I thank Anirban, uh, Chairman Sustainability Committee, um, for presenting the key highlights of the survey. My sincere thanks to all the expert speakers and the moderator of today's panel, Dr. Shukla, uh, Neelkant, Nilesh, Navneet, and Shantanu. Uh, today's discussions covered a very pertinent topic, uh, the roadmap for a developed India in 2047. The panel discussed steps that needed to, need to be taken for India to reach its aim of a Vixit Bharat in 2047. While the country is also readily ready developed in terms of digital infrastructure, we need to look at important aspects such as climate change, technology, uh, health and in income in inequality and ensure that growth shifts from poverty to middle income. They also spoke of areas of reform that are needed, urban infrastructure, and we just need to look out of the window for that, uh, where the biggest draw, which has been the biggest drawback for us uh, as compared to developed countries. Uh, and we need to break through, uh, and how do we break through from low to, uh, to middle income uh, was a question that was posed uh, and answered very pertinently. The Chamber has been able to successfully organize this, this impactful uh, event today. Uh, all of this could not have been accomplished without the strong and consistent support of the Board. Uh, a big thank you to each one of you. Uh, I would like to thank the audience for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here. We really appreciate it. I also thank the media for its presence, St. Regis for the arrangements, and last but not the least, I wish to thank the Bombay Chamber team, uh, the Bombay Chamber team, uh, under the able leadership of Sandeep Khosla for supporting and making this event a big progress, a, a big success. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Rajiv. Uh, uh, and uh, as we wind up, uh, I must just add that the gods have been very kind. When we chose 25th of June as the date, we had no idea that the BCCI, the other BCCI, much junior to us, would plan cricket in such a manner that one match, India-Australia, was yesterday, and the other semi-final is tomorrow. So we were right in between the two, and that's why at this audience. The second part was it didn't rain today, so we were very lucky. And the third most important was that 10 days back, the election commission announced the elections for the teacher's constituency and declared dry day from 24 to 26. So uh, the lobby of uh, restaurants went to court, and the court granted stay on yesterday and today, and the dry day starts tomorrow. <laughs> so please help us consume all the liquor which we have kept. See you good night, and uh, see you at our 189th uh, Foundation Day later in the year. Thank you. <laughs>